So welcome everybody to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro class. This is our third office hour for the uh, summer and fall course. Um, we really only have one question that was submitted by Aaron, which is, can you demo how you use the iPad? And so I think that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll focus on that. If you have any questions as we go along, feel free just to unmute yourself and ask the question, um, mostly because I'll be looking down at the iPad, so it'll be more difficult for me to catch if somebody's put something in the chat. And um, we'll go from there, but uh, thanks for showing up. So I'm going to switch this over to just speaker view. So Javin, can I ask one quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Or, or a comment anyway. Please. Is, um, since I've posted that question, mm. I went through the process of deciding that I really want to draw, mm. uh, do a hand draw. So do you mind going through the whole process that you have planned and then following up with if somebody makes that choice? And the reason I went back to that choice is just because I've always hand drawn and I don't do, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not a designer, but at the same time, I feel like that's where my my strength, well, I shouldn't say my strength, my strength is plants, but I should say that that I, I think I'm going to go that route. Okay. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah, we can, um, we can go over the conversation and the conversation uh, is, is pretty much the same um, when we're talking about drawing on paper versus drawing digitally. A um, couple of things that we don't have in uh, real life drawing that we do in digital drawing is uh, automatic um, distance and scaling, which we can automatically create. But as long as we decide on a scale, and I can go over that as well. I'm not set up to do that specifically today, but I can explain it. And then potentially if we wanted to do it again, I might be able to do like, I might be able to put this camera as a top down and like show the drawing process. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. I'm going to bring on the iPad. Stop the nostril cam, because nobody wants to see that. And then start to share. Okay, cool. And hello, Karen, good to have you here. Okay, so we're gonna go over the iPad and start talking about this. So I think first things first, so I started um, using a very old iPad. It was, I think, an iPad second gen or third gen. Um, it was um, a relatively inexpensive when I bought it. I think it was a couple hundred bucks. Um, I bought the Gen 1 pencil, which is uh, frustrating. <laughs> um, having now tried the Gen 2 pencil versus the Gen 1 pencil, there's kind of no comparison. The Gen 1 pencil had a lot of had a lot of bugginess and problems, but it worked well for a long time. I also picked up years ago a Wacom pad, uh, tablet, which is a separate tablet that has a separate pencil that you put on your desk and you draw on, and then that acts as a mouse input. So in different programs, you can use that directly and draw with it. And you can work with things like Inkscape and GIMP. Um, and now that I've gotten kind of interested in all the different digital ways, there's one called Affinity, um, which is an Adobe knockoff, which is very inexpensive and it's a lifelong uh, purchase. So I think I paid 35 bucks for it. And um, for folks that are wanting to go that illustrator route and wanting to go that route with, you know, something like a Dan Helsley's United Designers approach, um, it's a good way to go, uh, especially if you want everything done for you. So Dan's work is fantastic for that. He's created um, entire uh, scaling and iconography and plants and abbreviation codes. And that's all connected to the uh, natural capital plant database. So for folks, folks that want into that ecosystem and they just want to jump in and learn a digital program and jump and, and jump to it, it's great. Um, I'm a little bit more freeform. I drew with pen and paper for a long time. I worked at different sizes and scalings, started with eight and a half by 11, went to 11 by 17. Uh, went all the way up to um, two feet by whatever the, I think it was uh, 19 inches or 21 inches or something like that. Um, but found over time that I really liked 11 by 17 because it could fit on an extended um, clipboard. So this used to be my, still here actually. This used to be the board that I took out into the field, which uh, if you like working at size, this is great. 
Um, but over time, I just, the convenience factor of working at that scale, but having it on a digital asset was, it just was more convenient. Um, and I was also really easy to make changes to layers. So right now I'm on a 2021, 2021, 2022, whatever was the most recent, I finally upgraded off of my 2018 iPad Pro. Um, and then just picked up this awesome case that can go into the field, it has this great uh, hold in the back and then has a ability to, to throw it on a, a lanyard. And then the thing I like most about this, the thing I dislike about this version is that the pencil just sits on the side of the case by itself with unless you have this case so this has been great because it actually feels very secure now so i really like this a couple other gadgets this is a very simple prop um i think i got this from ikea for about four bucks and basically if it's flat and surface it brings the ipad to a perfect drawing um level the thing i just figured out about this case is that it has a, a prop on the back which I think you can see like so, and will lay perfectly at the angle I like to draw it. So I'm really quite excited about um, this case. It's done, it's done some great, um, done some great workflow improvements already. So as I was talking with Nico when we started, uh, when I started, I was working mostly with Procreate. Procreate is primarily an art application and. Uh, great for shading, great for working with layers. Basically, if you know how to use a pencil, uh, paint, uh, pencil crayon, you know how to use Procreate. It's very intuitive, it's very easy. They've added a couple of different elements to it. One is drawing assist and different types of grids, which is pretty phenomenal. So um, I'm just gonna bring up Procreate here. And just gonna bring in a photo and I'm gonna start sharing this. I just have to make, I'm just gonna take a look through the gallery and make sure there's nothing um, private that I need to put someplace else. No, that's fine. Okay, so back over to Zoom. And we're gonna share screen. Okay, so that's being shared for me. So it should be shared for you. And now we're gonna go over to Procreate. And so basically in Procreate, um, we're gonna start with a photo that's being brought in and we're gonna start, I think we're gonna work with that say, the same photo throughout this. So this is Procreate and uh, we've got this as a base layer. Base layers in the top right-hand corner here. And this is nice because you can make layers. And this is the one thing that Google Slides does not have, um, which if it had, I think we would all not be cursing Google Slides. But what it does have is, is exceptional in many ways and, and exceeds a lot of these programs in many ways. So first thing we'll do is we'll create a, a second layer to work on. And I'll usually, um, I'll usually um, label my layers. So rename, and we'll just call this, we'll call this our plant layer. Oh. Plant layer. I wonder if it'll pick that up. Yeah, oh, perfect, great. So we're gonna click off of that and click back on it. Okay, so now on this layer, we can draw. So in the top right-hand corner, we've got brushes. Um, Peppermint is my nice sketching one, which I really enjoy. And I usually like sketching in blue or red. Um, because I'm such a stickler to keep blue away from uh, anything for vegetation, I'll tend to go red. And the nice thing is, is you can pinch and zoom so you can make this smaller and bigger uh, and you can work with it. Now, the, the one thing we don't have here is scale. So um, what I've done in the past is I brought in an image of a ruler on a layer and I've moved it around, which is a lot of work to be in scale. So this is what I'm, I'm kind of describing why I decided not to go with this. Um, the other thing you can do is you can bring in a grid and you can overlay a grid, but basically with this, you know, um, this was actually done. Uh, so we ended up doing this big hoogle bed. We took the water from the roof, ran it into big old pipe, then came into the back, ran it into the back here. And so 
we were able to to bring that in. So what I'll do when I'm I'm bringing in a site like this, if I'm doing my different layers, so let's say I'm doing my my zones layer. I'm going to turn this layer off. You can see that little check mark. I'm just turning off the layer. So let's say this is our zone layer. Well, zone one for these folks is basically, you know, they've got two cars here, which they park, and basically they come in and out on a daily basis. This is, for all intents and purposes, this is probably our zone one. So this will be zone one. Uh, then we've got our zone two and zone two, you know, a couple times a week is coming out and into the backyard and much to my stepmother's delight. My father is no longer holding all of his um, extra building materials in the backyard. So he no longer goes in this area, which is great for them. The other thing I really like about this program is there's a two finger touch to undo. So if I make a line, I'm taking two fingers, putting it down on the screen and it's automatically removing. And if I put three fingers, it's automatically coming back. So undo and redo is really easily, really easy. Um, then as we're getting into zone four, so zone or pardon me, zone three. So this is more of a zone three. This is more of a zone three. This actually could be considered more a zone four but they tell me that they're moving more in this area. So that's fine. So that's a zone three. And then we've got uh, probably a light purple we'll go with. Maybe something like this. And this is the color wheel. I don't think I explained that. Um, so the color wheel has a couple of options at the bottom here. We've got disc, classic, harmony, value, and palettes. So for some designs, I'll have a full palette that I work with. Um, but generally I'll have my history of colors and I'll just keep with those. So then we've got uh, zone four and zone five. So uh, zone four is, is sometimes, so I know sometimes they're around here. Oh, and the balcony, I should have put in the balcony. So we'll do that in a sec. So that's about a zone four. So we'll go here, go zone four. And then we're gonna go back to our um, history. So we're gonna go back to our orange as a zone two. I'm going to put that into the balcony. And then uh, and then we'll do zone five. And I think I'll go with this dark purple for zone five. Now this is a base map as is. Um, because there's been a couple of things that have been added to the site, there are, it's a little different now. There we go. Cool. And now sometimes you can do automatic fill like that, which works out really nicely. Um, and this is the nice thing about programs like this is that you can do these automatic fills and then you can change their opacity and all the rest of it, but you can fill those in afterwards if that's, if that's a desire. So, you know, I would call this our zone map and I just have to make sure I put in that last zone. So zone five, and this would be the sketch. This would be my rough drawing that I would go through and take a look at all my uh, patterns of mobility and frequency of use, and then basically design off of that. So, I like working in um, a, a rough pencil when I'm when I'm designing and drawing. Uh, just it has a nicer feel. Oh, the other thing is that on these iPads, um, you can get paper-like screen protectors. Um, I started with paper-like, and then I found a very low-cost option. Paper-like's close to 45, 55 bucks, and then I think I found one. I think I found one that was twelve dollars for two, and it was actually better. I actually liked it better. So um, when when uh, we process the video, I'll, I'll make sure to find all the links for everything and throw them in there. Um, so this this was great. I enjoyed this. Uh, Procreate was was enjoyable, especially when you're starting to get into design, because once you have your zonation and, and, and let's say we go into our um, uh, into our microclimate. So microclimates and zones can be um, microclimate. Uh, Zonations and, and zones can be super useful for design and we do a lot of back and forth on those. So zones, Oop. there we go, zones. So microclimate, uh, you know, if we've got a real, a real hot spot, so say we've got um, our hot spot here is kind of like so. And so usually when I'm drawing, I'll change line weights and conversations just so that way I can see through different elements. 
because if we just did a block of color, an outline block of color, it'd be hard to see. And because this is, I'm just sketching as I'm going here, I, I don't really care where I'm putting my legend. I'll figure that out later. So this is sunny, hot, and relatively dry. Usually three things I put in for microclimates, I put in the solar, I put in the temperature, and I put in the moisture. And then we've got some shady spots and uh, shady spots are the one time where I'll, where I'll, uh, I'll be okay with using blue, but I still, I still default to, um, to purple. So just gonna muck about with some couple of different colors here. So this is um, shady, uh, I would say warm and also dry. This site is very dry. There's not a lot of wet areas here. And I would say that this area here is kind of like that. So now if I'm looking at this and I go, okay, we've got some spots that are right close to zone one. So this area here, we've got some spots that are close to zone one and also are hot and dry. This may be a good place to start placing different elements. So I might go back to um, my plant layer. And if I highlight that plant layer, I can go and sketch it out. I go back to that plant layer and I decide to go to something a bit more neutral. Um, maybe a green because I'm doing vegetation. You know, this area here, uh, sorry about the names, uh, I hit it, there we go. This area here might be a great spot for some um, zone one vegetation because it's so close to the house. So if, we, if we're if we working with lettuces or something like that, this might be a good spot. Um, I know that these clients, uh, my dad and his stepmom have no desire to do annual gardening. Um, they just don't want to do it. So that doesn't really matter to me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna worry about that. But if I was designing this fresh and and thinking about it, and if that was one of the design criteria, that would be important. Now, what we did end up working on, because it was a value to them, and so I'm just gonna turn off these two. Was this huga culture? This um, this raised huga culture here, and uh, my dad being in construction and having access to a lot of materials, he ended up. Uh, putting this together. And so that little area that we're seeing on the map, he put in with, um, with some advice from me, he had some posts, some metal posts and some wooden posts, and he had some extra um, roofing material. He's worked in roofing and siding and soffit for a very long time. And then uh, ended up putting in big old pipe, running it down in the hookah culture trench, um, and then having it uh, swing back around in the back there. So um, this was a great example of of design in process being put there and, and a place where they don't mind coming and accessing. You can see there are two cars there from our design. So coming out here and designing with this and working with this is great. So this is one of those spots where we designed, I think we put in has caps. So I think we put has caps on center and then there was a valiant grape we put in there. Uh, which was awesome. And then I had a bunch of extra strawberries in the, in the yard. Cause I was, um, I designed my system in such a way that I have these 30 inch by, uh, they're about 30 feet long, 30 inch by 30 feet long beds. And then I use black geo woven, uh, sunbelt textile for growing my strawberries in only cause strawberries in my area take quite a bit of weeding and I'm, I'm allergic to straw funny enough. So I left the pathways open so that way the runners would have a place to land and propagate. And in each of my pathways, I had, I think close to 300 runners. So I sent him a bunch of strawberries. So he had all these strawberries that he could then place in here. So this is my, these are my rough drawings. These are the drawings I'm using to, to basically understand and work with the site. And then I'll usually do what's called a render. So I'll bring up, and I think I did most of my renders because it was only recently that I started moving away from, um, Procreate. I think I did most of my renders here. So this is a, a good example of what it looks like when I'm I'm playing with and drawing with. And you can see that um, this was some of my first ideas and uh, some of my first drawings and, and what it might look like here. So you can see these different elements. I'm just going to pull up one more layer so I can make some notes here as we're we're mucking about. So yeah, this this was that. Um, that bed we just saw that was drawn and then and then constructed. Um, and then this is how it would look eventually. So we'd have these valiant. So, okay. Well, it's good for sketching. It's not great for, um, there we go. 
Uh, so this is the Valiant grape, which is a good uh, zone two grape, uh, plant hardiness zone, Canadian. And so we wanted something that would come up to the top of that fence and also fold over on the other side um, because the stepmom was really wanting a little bit of color on the inside. And we could have gone with Arctic Kiwi. So we could have gone with the Kolomitka or the Hardy, but um, decided with the grapes. And then we've got this sort of uh, tiered aspect and you'll find this in design. You really want to think about sizing and scope and scale. So one thing that, um, I think I'll move back to this one. One thing that's important is to understand shaping. So usually clustering in threes and then what's behind. So especially for aesthetic design, I learned this a little too late in my career. Um, what's beautiful gets managed. So you really wanna make things look beautiful. And a lot of designers who are brand new to plants will, or if they're more production oriented, will, will keep things very dispirited. So like you'll have seven currants, but they'll be all over the yard instead of, right beside each other so that way it's easy to harvest and you actually get this layered effect so we usually clumps in threes fives and sevens and we do it also vertically so if this is you know our vertical similar to what we have down here if we had a plan view of this you know we would have our top view of these three and then we would have our our small shrubs so generally with um Procreate, you can you can design, you can create, you can work with a, a number of different layers and levels and, and just sketch. And um, more and more, I'm taking the iPad into the field and, and using it as a, as a sketching tool in the field, um, especially to, to allow clients to kind of see what I'm thinking. So um, I take a photo and I start drawing and I'm showing folks what I'm thinking and looking at. So you can see up here, we had a conifer tree monitor, remove and chip as needed, and he has. Um, uh, monitor as well, uh, remove 30% of this crab, uh, graft with um, edibles. The crab isn't that, all that edible. This is definitely remove and chip. So this is an old uh, cottonwood that um, everything basically above here, oops, everything above here is basically dead and it's just shooting from the bottom. So all of these are widow makers, aptly named. Uh, so those renders, this is another reason why I like the iPod, iPad, because I get to take a photo and do renders and, 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 and basically show the client what I'm thinking in my mind. Sometimes it can be difficult to, to show and, and create. The other thing that's nice about Procreate is, is it has a perspective that you can turn on. So you can create a vanishing point and then you can snap to that vanishing point. So in the front here, there's an easement that we can't plant in because there's a gas line here on the right hand side. So I turn on the perspective and then basically there's a drawing assist tool, uh, drawing guide. So edit drawing guide. So this is the perspective here so we can move the eye line. Basically we set it and take a look and um, then we can change it at the bottom here and then we can put assisted drawing there at the bottom. And now I can draw lock to those lines so it can make it really easy for drawing. I think that was it for that one. And then again, as we're starting to design and think about these things, it's great to take these bright photos and, um, and showcase. So in that previous photo, I, I don't know if you remember, but that previous photo, there was a tree that we were going to monitor and chip. Um, uh, he, <laughs> he monitored and he chipped, but he left this base as Jan's, uh, Jan's throne. So there's this cool little uh, stump that he's turned into a throne for Jan. Uh, my stepmom and then we started to design out the pathways and then underneath this I'm just going to make another layer here um, we figured that in between these pathways because this design has evolved you know this is uh, okay I'm going to pop that up there we go um, that we're going to do plantings here and this was going to be the strawberry zone so this was going to be hot dry you plant at the top and then of course they run her down and then when they run her down into the pathway, you harvest these and then you plant them and you use those to fill in other spots in the site. Um, so yeah, Procreate I use generally when I wanna create a quick render and I wanna sketch something out and just kind of get the idea in and out. Um, as I did previously, I just visited a, a friend and um, oh, this is also a good example. So this is actually in. These are, uh, this is this Hoogle. Uh, we've talked about this probably a few times, if not. Um, basically what this is, is this is a 
call this my big e huga culture and uh the way that it looks now is it's got three tines not four and basically the shop <clears throat> the shop comes out i'm just going to put this new one all at the top there we go it's just so i can do some explaining So basically this shop has about 30,000 liters of water. I'm just gonna brighten that up a bit. There we go. That's the eraser right there. So this shop has about 30,000 liters of water and it's roughly the same shape and size as um, this area here. So it's, you know, this and this. So this area is 30 and this area is 30. So it's about 60,000 liters of water. And what I was, I was mucking about with was, can I have a completely zero watered garden, be it annual or otherwise? And it's turned out this way. So this is a um, couple years old now, because this I think I designed this in, what, what does it say down here? Uh, 2020, yeah. So basically this hookah culture is down here. It's got this drip line. Um, so water comes off, oh, I'm still on my eraser. Water comes off here, comes down to the hugel. Uh, this hugel is is below ground and isn't proud. So basically, what this looks like is we've got our shop, and then we've got our trenches, and then we've got this center tine trench, and the hugels are are raised on the tines, but not here. So this is just regular ground. So basically, this water comes down, infiltrates here, wets this, and during the heat dome last year, we got up to about 53 C, which I think tops about 121 Fahrenheit. And we didn't have to water this at all. So hookah cultures are self-watering only in as much as you provide them water. So if I provide water to this pretty much year round and it has the chance to charge up, it works out really, really well. So this is a great example of how I, how I used this program to design. This was before I found the other ones. And so we've got um, a lot of different areas here so grouping is great so you can group a lot of these elements and put them together so that way you can take a look at different elements i tend to design with the key line scale of permanence for all things agricultural so you'll so things like things like climate topography water access forestry buildings fencing things like that and it's um it's a nice structure to hang everything off of so you can always hang your design so to speak off of them so i think what happened is i was designing yeah i was designing in perspective Kind of showcasing what this might look like, um, bringing different elements in, showing different details. We had all these old, uh, well, we had all these trees here that we were worried about fire damage. So we took them down and uh, we left them proud. But uh, ponderosa uh, rot is very, very, very pervasive here. Didn't know that when I started. So all of these posts came down and we ended up sinking posts actually just the other day. Um, working with a very simple title blocks which i drew at the bottom and generally you know i'm just I'm, I'm making easy simple designs that i can work with and 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 run with and you can kind of see what i did here so is this this one yeah so if we open this up uh we've got this con yeah there we go so there's that huga culture piece so we're going to remove the access we're going to remove the fencing and now you can see the tines that i'm working with so it's it's pretty brilliant that you can play with these different models and, and see the different elements. And so basically with Procreate, the, the greatest things here is that undo, redo, different layers, sketching, you can use perspective, um, you can put on a grid if you want. And then the one thing I really enjoy about Procreate is that you can group different elements. So if you wanna turn off or turn on an element, you can, <laughs> excuse me. And I think that probably covers most appropriate for design. Any questions? Feel free just to mute. So what you're reviewing are program, software programs for iPad. Is that correct? Come again? Uh, what, you're, what you're reviewing are software programs for iPad specifically? Yeah, yeah, Karen, I think you came in a little bit late. Um, the only question we had was a follow over or a carryover from last week, which was, um, how do you use iPad for design? Gotcha. Yeah. I was just wondering if any of these apply to laptop as well. Um, 
Procreate doesn't, Concepts doesn't, and Morpholio, Morpholio Trace do not. Um, the the applications for those that I've used before is SketchUp. I've yep. used Affinity. Um, and as of late, I've defaulted to working with um, uh, Google Slides only because it is so easy and it's very simple to, to make quick renders. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move on to the next one? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, I was, I made it, I almost made it through the entire summer without allergies, but July hit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about another application. So I'm just gonna switch over uh, to Morfolio Trace. So Morfolio Trace is um, a pretty phenomenal program. It's, it's primarily created uh, as an architect's program. Uh, there are some amazing tutorials online and uh, designers, if you sign up for the Morfolio Trace newsletter, almost monthly they'll send you designers and I uh, just got introduced to a couple working in Sweden who use Morfolio Trace exclusively for their design work. So really like that. So I'm gonna start at the beginning only because um, it's, it's useful to see the process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the library we're going to bring in uh, an image from the library. We're going to bring in the same image. It's going to come in. And uh, immediately what you see on the right-hand side, similar to Procreate, is we've got layers. So at the top uh, area here, we've got add uh, a new tracing paper. Below it, we've, we've got add a new photo. And then we've got add text. And then we've got our two layers. Now, with layers, when layers come in, they'll have a certain amount of opacity as a tracing piece of paper. Unlike Procreate, that new layer will always have zero opacity or 100% opacity. Um, but because this is a, for architects, there's this idea of that tracing paper is down. And then you can also change that, that color, that tracing paper color and go black. Um, I just always have it as at uh, no opacity so I can see through it. Um, one of the things I love about this is there's two things. One, you can take images directly from Google Earth. So if you want to bring in an aerial from Google Earth, you can, or you can bring in an image and then you can uh, create measurements. So in the top left-hand corner, the fourth one to the right there, we've got the measurement tool. And so what I'll do is I'll take the two corners with my pencil and I'll bring them down to my scale bar. And then I'll make sure they're roughly right. Turn it to metric, put the input at 10 meters say okay and now everything on my on my canvas is scaled so if i bring out my ruler my ruler is perfectly aligned with my site so you know, if i'm trying to figure out well how long is a is a 10 20 foot meter row it's right there so i can i can quickly go back and forth uh, the nice thing as well about this is that with this ruler is that this ruler acts like a ruler in real life, so I can draw along it. The other thing is, is that if you move away from this ruler, it'll still draw with that same, that same, um, that same degree. So if I move the ruler again, I make a line, it'll draw parallel lines to that ruler, which is fantastic. It's such a useful thing to have. Um, so you do have the ability to use that ruler. And then of course you've got, uh, different rulers and compasses and things of that nature, which you can then turn off. And I'm just going to erase all this. The other thing that's really great about, um, about trace is that it has a number of stencils. So if you want to bring in a stencil and move a stencil around, you can. And these stencils allow you to then design. So let's say we'll, we'll, we'll keep with this idea of the, this Hoogle box that they created. So we can come to our, um, we can come to our stamps or scales and we can bring in any number of different ones. So we can bring in 
um, a couple of different elements here. So I think probably the shrubs would be good. So we can bring in the shrubs, we can size them appropriately. Then all we have to do is grab a color, use a big marker, and I want to use green. And then we can just move that along. Now there's two ways to do this. We could either go and draw that out every single time, or we can use the lasso. We can use the lasso tool enough here, and we can copy this. So easy enough to copy it, and then grab this new one and move it over. So this can be really quick if you're designing and putting different elements in, and because we all know how to use a pencil and generally. Um, the gestures movement on digital devices is pretty common to us. It's easy to move over, design and create, design and create, design and create. Um, as we design and move out, we can uh, design and scale and scope. And then if we're working um, in scale again, uh, and this, this was true of a previous client we were just working on here. Um, this was uh, somebody I believe in your class we we're able to go in and quickly design out different elements and give different elements um, uh, kind of a scope and a scale here. So this is a food forest that I'm working on down in uh, Langley. I'm a consulting designer on. <clears throat> and so with this, we were able to design it. And uh, because this is scaled already, once this is taken out, they can, or, or uh, exported, they can print this and then they can take it into the field and start to design with it. And we can design details into it. So Morfolio Trace, the two things that it, uh, that it adds as opposed to uh, Procreate is it adds a scaling aspect. Um, the other thing that's really interesting that I played with a little bit is it has a, an AR camera. So you can actually design something in Procreate and then you can take your iPad out into the field and if you have landmarks, you can walk through your design because it does have a 3D component to it, which I haven't explored all that much. I know good colleagues and friends of mine design in 3D. Um, I haven't found it's necessary. I know a lot of people like to do it, but uh, I can communicate quickly enough with designs and 3D renders. This was a, a friend of mine who wanted to put in a greenhouse. So we put, um, we put uh, his wife out in the field and then we just started to design around her scope and scale just to give the different elements of it, um, just to showcase what all the different pieces would be. And this is, again, one of the great values of working with um, an iPad or a, a graphic tablet. The other graphic tablets, I've, I've looked at them. I've looked at the galaxies, um, the, latency, the latency, the pencil latency. So latency is when the pencil's on the screen and as you're moving it along, how quickly the digital line follows the physical line. Um, it was low for a number of years. Now it's on par with anything we have. Um, we, <laughs> I'm so deep into the Apple I system or Apple ecosystem. Um, what it doesn't have is it doesn't have the number of programs that uh, I use now. So I've, I'm so embedded in these programs that I'm, I'm basically in Apple. Uh, that being said, I have an Android phone because I don't like the phones. Uh, however, uh, Infinity is also on iPad and on Galaxy. And if I was wanting to be um, uh, not confined to a digital ecosystem, I'd probably go with Infinity and, and use that because I could, as Karen was asking, I could transfer that to um, to my, my laptop and I could, I could exchange files and things of that nature. But up until now, I've just, I've enjoyed drawing and making quick, simple, easy drawings and then designing as is. So um, this is a, a property that I'm working on right now. And uh, the clients have generously said, you know, if you, if you can ever use any of the material to showcase and, and, and help other people understand this site, please do. So this is uh, 75 acres. It's a North South Valley. So in terms of valley form, it's right at the toe of the slope before we get to the bottom of the valley. Most of it, as you can see from the contour lines, as they're very, very close together, and we'll just turn off a couple of things here. Um, very, very, very steep. So we've got a very steep area at the top and then it, it gets less at the bottom. So in a design like this, I'm just gonna bring up the other one I was working on. 
in a design like this, we're, we're trying to understand and work with the different elements. And so, so much of this is about sketching and drawing. And this is why I, I, I even say to the tutorials, you know, sketching and drawing on paper is going to be a lot more attuned to who you are as a person, as opposed to a computer, you know, a computer is just a light break for bad ideas. So if the idea is bad, the computer will just, you know, highlight its terribleness. If you're working on paper because our our hands and our minds are, are so used to drawing, you'll you'll tend to get a sense of these different areas. So for example, when we were just, I was just recently at their place, this is their house. And then they've got a couple of animal areas here. And then at the top, they've got a greenhouse here, and then they've got a goat goat barn here. So in this design, as we were sketching out and talking, one of the things that they really loved is being able to sit here and just be able to look out onto uh, basically a zone five, right? This is going to be an area that they're not going to, to worry about changing. Uh, they're just going to keep as is. And as we were talking about potential um, income generation, uh, right here is what's called the Trans Canada Trail. So this is a trail that goes all the way across Canada. And a portion of it just happens to literally parallel uh, the majority of the eastern side of their property. It goes all the way down here. And then it goes all the way up here. And again, I could bring out the, the ruler and make a nice straight line, but we're just we're just chatting. So one of the ideas for income generation was to do um, a glamping or camping experience that folks could uh, jump into. So you know, some, some kind of uh, glamping. But when you start talking to your, your clients and sharing your designs, I like to think of design as not being Olympic. Like we're not, we're not reaching for a specific big high goal right at the beginning. We're, we're working with clients, we're developing something. We're basically sculpting in many ways. We're, we're creating something, sharing something, creating something, sharing something. <coughs> so as we were chatting about this view corridor, which, um, you know, you ask somebody, you know, what they want and, and what it is at the beginning of the design and then over, over conversations, they bring you something new. Uh, and, you know, parts of you may be like, you know, that would have been really useful to have at the beginning, but it happens. It's, it's how designs are created. So they're like, no, 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 we really like this view. Well, I know if we populated this by with a few more trees, we would very easily create a completely impenetrable um, view corridor, especially if we did it at the backside. So if we created something right here. So in that case, they they were kind of open to an idea where you could create like two or three really private sites that could produce a little bit of income generation and then have somebody on site. They're looking at having um, a farm manager that gets subsidized rent that would live on site that could manage that as well. So as we go out, <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting design. We really have this toe slope. So we have this this kind of flat area. So if we were to do this in cross section, so A to A apostrophe, what we would find is that it's quite steep and then flattens out and flattens out and flattens out. <clears throat> and then has a pretty tall thicket of trees and then comes down to totally flat Then another uh, thicket of trees and then pretty flat. <clears throat> So this toe of the slope is really their area to work because this area creates a pretty good roof effect. So we get a lot of runoff and in some of the other maps that I created for them, it's very uh, easy to see because we do one called total wetness indicator and we do one called uh, watershed, which shows accumulation of precipital values and then how it flows on the site. There's a couple of areas here that we might be able to tap for springs or, or other materials. So with this design, oh, Racing that too. So with this design, what we've decided is they're very fond of goats. And um, you'll find when you work with folks and, uh, and livestock, <clears throat> goats are one of those we love and we hate them. Um, I'm not a huge fan of working with goats. The fencing needed for them and the care needed for them is full. And uh, I'm much more of a hands-off livestock uh, operator. So I love that they love their goats. So what we've done is we've created an interesting 
um, design that basically is a block expansion. So uh, first and foremost, we worked with their constraints under their um, under their ability to give to the site. They're both um, entrepreneurs and academics and have a lot of time working. So this is the thing when you think about phasing, we're kind of getting into a full design conversation, but I think it's all right, unless somebody has um, any qualms. Uh, when we're thinking about phasing that, that one question in the client survey, how much time do you have to maintain this system per week and how much time do you have to put into it is so telling about what we can create. So for them, it was really low. And so I sat down with them recently and just said, listen, for what you want in terms of your design, I don't think the full design process, the full kit and caboodle is going to be available to you unless you have maintenance. So basically, as you have additional help and maintenance help, you can expand. If ever you lose that maintenance help, you contract. And so you need to think about moving out in blocks. So because their house is here and I helped them a little bit, they, they already had this idea, but I helped them with how to do this. There's quite a big field here. And if we bring out the ruler, because I think I had already done this. Um, no, I hadn't done this yet. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly make sure I'm scaled. Oh, the scale didn't come in on this one. Interesting. All right, well, I roughly know what this is so I can scale it here. This is about a hundred feet. Good. So if I bring the ruler back, there we go. About a hundred feet. So the nice thing about working in 25, 50 and hundred foot rows is that a lot of the uh, market gardeners who have popularized market gardening and have done a gardening and have done a great job, they're working in these, these types of increments until you get to Europe. So folks like Jean-Martin Fortier, um, Zach Lokes, uh, Curtis Stone, um, Elliot Coleman, there's, there's really this idea of these, you know, 25, 50, 75. So you can very quickly and easily subdivide this into these different rows. And because of that, you can work with uh, expanded design. And so what we talked about here is that, you know, you've got all this land and it, you, people generally want to use the land they have, but having nucleated design, close design that's close to the house can be under the farmers, the gardeners, the home, homeowner shadow. It's been said for a long time that the homeowner shadow is the, uh, is the fertility, the farmer shadow is the fertility that we need. This little block, this 100 by 100 block is basically their site in miniature. So whatever they have further along the line will be here in some form of representation. And this is an important design piece is that if you have a, a block of plums, if you have a block of apples, if you are in tropics and you have a block of oranges, it's important to have one or two key species or, or, or indicator species of, of that block close to the house. So um, we wanna have you know, a, a little apple, a little plum, a little pear here. So that way they can see directly as they're washing dishes, they can see if those are blooming. They can see if those aren't blooming. Um, with the rain that we've had in Canada over the last couple of months, a lot of trees and berries didn't set because the rain was basically knocking off blo blossoms, knocking off stamen, um, stamen, and uh, fruit set didn't set. Now, when a fruit does set, you want to see it. You want to understand it when it's starting to grow. So this is a great way because, again, they don't walk their whole property. We really wanted to have an area right close to their uh, close to their eye line that they could showcase. So what we designed here was uh, basically again in scale. So A to A apostrophe, A to A apostrophe. So basically this is going to be in miniature, we're gonna have a food forest on the right hand side, which will help with a bit of shading um, and uh, some, some wind aspect. And then here we're gonna have row crop. So we're gonna have all these row crops that then they can rotate as well. And I think what we've decided is they're going to work with Zach Loke's uh, permanent bed system. So that permanent bed is basically you're constantly building up soil within those beds. And what's nice about this is that uh, this is relatively easy to fence if they need to, and they can just fence blocks because the cost of fencing this entire property, especially the working area, the toe of the slope is going to be so expensive. 
um, this is a, a much easier way of going about it. Now, the next aspect here was uh, they've got access at the bottom here. So this is their access going along the bottom. And going along this bottom, they have access for themselves. But one of the things that forests like to do is propagate themselves. Forests like to make more forest. Uh, and especially different types of advantageous trees. So a couple of years ago, uh, the original owners of this site grabbed 10 sea buckthorn hippophae rhamnoides seeds, let them go and created uh, this thicket. So these areas here and this area here is this monster thicket of sea buckthorn. Let's bring up the ruler just to, yeah, so 250 feet by 100 feet thicket of sea buckthorn and not very good sea buckthorn. I harvested some last year and juiced it and it was not so good. So what we were talking about is they're going to need to manage this and the decision will have to be made if they want to keep this encroaching forest or if they want to have more space and land. Generally, we have a conversation of thinning the forest um, and working with risk management and fire management because it's necessary. So what we decided was to run a parallel fenced goat shoot. So basically it's gonna be a, a permanent area that's gonna be fenced out. And then they've, they've started to become comfortable with electric fencing. So basically they can run the goats and they can keep apprised and moving forward of management of these areas before they do planting. And that way they don't have to invest in, in um, fencing all at once. They can just make the goat run out to where they need to. They can make the next section, they can make the next section, and then they have they can have gates that come out. And then from there, they can have electrical fencing that they move because they're, they're never going to have all their goats out at once across a huge area. So basically we've got access at the top. So we have sort of goat access, access for goats. And then we have vehicle and human traffic. So vehicle and human access at the bottom. The other great thing that this does uh, is they can then have doors on the uphill side and they can fence up. One of the things that's really important, especially in my neck of the woods, is we get forest fires every single year with greater and greater intensity. And if you're curious about that, I made a documentary called Facing Fire, Building Resiliency to Wildfire on YouTube for free. It's 22 minutes and it describes how we got into our situation. But basically they need to run uh, the goats in here so that way the goats will graze out and browse up. And then they can go in and they can start to work um, some tree removal. And basically we're looking at a 10 to 15 meter uh, break within there because we're trying to increase the, the, the risk, decrease the risk of forest fire. Now, forest fires moving down slope are not as common. Uh, however, forest fires moving from this direction would be problematic. So basically we're trialing this goat grazing conversation upslope and what will eventually happen is that they'll probably move their shoot downslope as well and uh, graze out in little blocks as they move downslope as well. So I wanted to show you what a cacophony of idea generation this is because what you end up doing is taking these ideas and putting them into layers eventually and I, I put them usually into that key line scale of permanence. So I put them into a climate layer, topography layer, water layer, access layer. So that way each layer is specific. And the, again, the great thing about Morfolio Trace is that it has the stencils, it has the ability to move things around. You can lasso different elements because it, it has a pseudo vector approach to it and can work really well. And the nice thing is, is as you can see at the bottom, wherever I move that scale bar is moving with me. So if you see down here, this is that scale bar that moves with me as we go. And so over time, what I'll do is I'll develop um, a cleaner design. And in this case, in particular, I'll have a lot of details. So I'll have a detail about this big for this site. And then this will be brought in directly. And this is a great site where I might even run drone. So that way I've got uh, a clear ortho mosaic and use that as that base layer. What else can I talk about here? Hmm. So then you have the ability to print these as well, obviously, or is that yeah. obvious or not obvious? Yeah, so <laughs> e export is export is pretty simple. Um, 
and you can you can size export as well um you can size what you want it to be in terms of its total export uh generally i'm working mostly with um with export layouts that the client can print or if it's part of the deliverables i'll um oh, that's funny there we go or i'll just go pure digital i have a lot of remote clients that i'm not printing and then mailing i'm just sending with instructions that they can go off and print themselves and this creates a quick turnaround for design detail so i don't have to go and do that myself um the other thing to keep in mind is you know what's the level of detail they require so these clients they wanted a concept they didn't want full design layout like we're seeing here um with the bernakovich oasis so with that i'm giving generalized approaches of how to go about these things and generally what these these areas and scales will look like but not necessarily what they'll be um something else to keep in mind is uh, as you guys have seen um my printing and handwriting especially when i'm going fast is illegible to pretty much everyone including me so i tend to go back in and i'll bring in type so i'll click on the type and i'll type out everything so that way it's all very legible for the clients as well but yes to answer your question um uh, i do export for print and then those exports can either go into and i think i've showed you folks this before um, So these can then be exported and put into full designs. And then these designs can be put in and then rendered. So this is a three-dimensional render that I had uh, commissioned off of a lot of the sketching that I've done. So there's folks that work in Blender and uh, Vectorworks and 3D design. And usually for only a couple hundred bucks, I can get something digitally rendered and that the client can see if that's what they're going for. That that was for um, a commercial board of a company and they wanted to have something that they could show to everyone and that they could digitally share. Um, but basically I always share with my clients what the cost of rendering is because it, it takes time and money. And so if they want something simple, that's great, it's included. If they want extra time on that rendering, then it costs. And I just, I share the cost with them, I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't shoulder those costs. Any other questions? I don't even know what time it is. Oh, it's right at 11. There we go. <laughs> Any other questions about this, folks? Thoughts, queries, questions, comments. I guess just if, if I want to, I might have to go through the process of drawing and then getting to the digital later down the road. I mean, because I'm loving all of this, um, but at the same time, yeah, just because I've done that mostly, and I think I need to go there with this experience. Is there any other? So basically, I went through the whole the Jesse Bloom one two three is on on drawing the base map and everything awesome. um so i'm just at the point where i'm doing the layers and i bought tracing paper so i'm, I'm gonna go that route this this time around is there any advice on that and i'm sorry if you gave me some and i haven't listened to it yet on my oh, comments no that's fine um yeah so basically <clears throat> a couple of things that i've learned from doing base maps by hand is when you have that original base map, try to get everything that is pre-existing on there, including vegetation, uh, vegetation that isn't going to move. So um, anything with a woody stem, anything with a multi-stem, I put onto that base map because I want to know if I'm going to remove it or not. And then from there, I like to make landmarks on the corners. And these are just little, little squares, little landmarks. I wonder if I have every, anything close by. I don't think I do um little landmarks on the corners and that we want to put my tracing paper on i immediately match up the landmarks and i trace the landmarks and so that allows me to put the tracing paper exactly where i need to put it um and then from there the you know the reason why tracing paper in the industry is called bum wad is because you're supposed to use a lot of it you know it's supposed to be rinse and repeat rinse and repeat rinse and repeat so really play with drawing and when i was teaching in person we used to do these things called six or eight ups 
And basically I would take the base map in miniature, um, put it on an eight and a half by 11. So I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, grayscale, uh, probably 30 to 40% opacity, print it out and then do quick sketches on each of these. So you're not using that scale, whatever scale you're like, if you're at 11 by 17, or if you're even by eight and a half by 11, it's a lot of, it's a lot of space. So I would do these quick sketches over and over and over to see and to, to play out my ideas. Um, and what's great about that is that in, in uh, eight up or six up, you can very quickly root out what's weird about your design um, and kind of, kind of move it over and, and explain it to yourself. This is the other thing I've learned is that explaining the design to yourself is really useful. You have to like, you have to prove it in architecture school. You're always in front of the jury and the judge, and you're always defending what you're doing. And in many ways I've adopted that within uh, regenerative landscape design because I, I'm proving to myself, does it actually make sense or am I just, um, do I have confirmation bias? You know, this is amazing because I made it. <laughs> we want to we want to move away from that. And especially in permaculture, please don't do this. I, I will call everyone out on it. Don't go up to the permaculture shelf, pull out a herb spiral and plunk it into the site. Don't walk along the permaculture shelf and grab Bokashi and plug it into the site. Really think about does does this element actually serve the functions that necessary? So in the final design, there's a, a conversation about how do how does this design interact? How does this design interact with the other elements of the design? And that's one of the most important things, right? The the work that we do is is largely mental in this process. We're going onto site, we're being with the site, we're interacting with the site, and as I've added more years to my work, I'm really asking the site, what do you wanna be? Because it's very, very easy to apply the human mind onto the site. And um, what, what's his name, Brown something. He was a, he was a, wilderness, a wilderness skills instructor, Tom Brown, down in the States. Tom Brown? Yeah, yeah. I think it's Tom Brown. Yeah, his, yep, yep. his conversation is great. You know, what's the loudest thing in the forest? human mind what does it sound like it sounds like a trash can going down a suburban alleyway at three in the morning so we're trying to minimize that and we're trying to come to the site at about three feet tall on our knees just like your your son there going like what's happening here and what's over there and why is that like that and huh that's really interesting and i find approaching a site like that the, the very first walk i do of a site now i don't i don't come with ipad i don't come with phone i don't come with notebook i'm just walking the site I'm just trying to be in the site and understand the site and feel the site. And as I'm moving through thermal climbs being like, huh, that's interesting. We just dropped temperature. Why is that? And looking around and then seeing this amazing um, drainage, air drainage, water and air drainage, and it comes down and it funnels water and it funnels air and the air passes over the water and then it passes over me. It's like, oh, this is a cool zone. Huh? This is not where our fruit trees go. You know, fruit trees are going to be having uh, cool air wash over them all the time, which fruit trees love. They don't. What we what we want to do is is become these sensors, which I think um, the indigenous folk that I've worked with over the years have really passed on as education to me. Um, is I need to challenge a lot of my Western mind is best. My body's just there to walk around my head to go think things. Our bodies are there to sense the world and to interact with the world and the digital drawings, the hand drawings are just representation of the thinking we have on paper. And that's why when Neil years ago showed me his, his PowerPoint designs, there was definitely a part of me that was really always moving to that, that 3D render. It was like, it was offended. <laughs> it was offended that something should be so simple. And it, it took me a while to realize the genius in it, the simpler the design on paper, the less time it takes for you to render your thoughts onto paper. And that's all it is. You're just rendering your thoughts. But if you're drawing, that process of drawing can help you design and create. And that's what's so important about this work is that you need a vehicle to play. And that's really what this is, to play back and forth and to leave a design for a while, come back and draw it anew, to regenerate it from your mind and go, okay, what makes sense here today? And so these clients, and I like, I like a long-term client. I like working with clients for six to 12, sometimes um, 18 months, because I like being on site two, three, four times, especially if I'm designing for uh, millennial, uh, uh, pardon, millennium or 
centennial areas. So if I've, I've this is a feet for pro, feet first feet feet first property, which is they will be taken out from this property feet first. They'll be dead. Um, they want a sense of longevity, and I can't give that to them if I'm going to see the site twice and put something on paper. It's just it's so ingenuous to say that we that any of us can do that. That being said, there are folks like Sepp Holzer who I've I've seen walk onto a site and be like, "This is what you do," and he brings in the excavators the next day, and it's it's largely correct. Um, I'm not there yet. I got probably another 30 years to go before I'm close to where Sepp is today. Um, but I would say more and more, I'm finding that my first thoughts on site are translating to like 80 to 90 percent of what I come to after about you know a year and a, a bit of work. So. That also, I think, is an important piece because you want to be in that site and feel that site and not. <laughs> this is, this is, I don't know if this is me making the case against this course or for this course, but this is this is by far one of the most comprehensive PDCs on the planet in terms of design and interaction and conversations. It, it is. Um, no other PDC has this number, has this level and number of assignments and uh, back catalog of studies that support what we're talking about. And it's digitally based. And I think it can force the student into a digital mindset instead of a lived mindset, which is so ridiculously important. It's, it's paramount. And I think if I could relay anything, it would be that, you know, be on your site as much as possible, play with your site as much as possible, draw with your, draw your site on your site as much as possible and and really be in that place take the photos have the lived environment sure look at the data but the data as i've talked about in the climate survey is just a beginning point and in some situations not even because it's just so dispirited because the local weather station is 100 miles away so be in that site work with that site and then whatever the drawing or rendering works for you and is easiest and i say this in the very first tutorial whatever is the easiest go with that because you don't have to learn these rendering techniques for this course definitely not the point is is to learn the permaculture mindset the process to look on site and go well how can this serve many functions does this need to be here um am i valuing the marginal here or am i just looking at it as a pain and i think you know that and i'll end with this is probably one of the most important things and jeff lawton said this best I had the opportunity to study with Jeff a couple of times. You know, it's very easy to be at war with the world. All we have to do is walk out the door and hate something or dislike something. And we're going to walk through life with these blinders. And it's like a screen. You can only see a little bit. And so if you walk out the door with, I hate this plant or this water's terrible, that's what you'll see. That's what your design will, will create. But if you walk out the door going, interesting, what is this and what is the function it plays in this landscape and how can it be utilized? you will find innovative solutions. So the story I'll use to back this up is I was recently visiting a, a good friend and colleague over on uh, Salt Spring Island and I introduced him to a client, a former colleague and student of this course. Um, he's local, always a better choice. I always go with somebody local if, if they've got the skill and ability. Uh, but he goes on, he installs their uh, rainwater harvesting system and then the irrigation system that's off that. And now they're bringing in somebody to, to assess solar. Now, generally, solar is best on a south-facing um, south structure that is pre-existing because ground mounts cost lots of money. And generally, we're going to have those at a, at a stock angle. We're not going to move them throughout the year. Just the amount of effort and all the rest of it just doesn't come out. But their roof slopes east, so it doesn't, doesn't really work. And the different areas that they has, has had for ground mounts, mounts spaces were bedrock. So you're doing a lot of blasting, you're doing a lot of hole creation. It's just it's an expensive proposition. So I'm looking at this and I'm walking around, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at their cars and Salt Spring is a very rainy place. Um, I think uh, in May and June, they had close to 40 days of rain straight, which is one of the reasons why I don't live there anymore. Um, so I'm looking around and looking at this, I'm looking at their cars, I'm looking at this, I'm going, well, if they're gonna purchase a ground mount, why wouldn't they at least create an open air roof structure, garage structure for their vehicles and potentially do a, a greenhouse add-on? Because if they're gonna spend that money anyways, why not add 20% and just create what they need? And then 
they could put a, a south facing slope on it. And this is also the area where the cars are coming in. So I offered this as an idea and I said, you know, you may hate this idea because it's more work, but I'm looking at this going, if we gain something by having um, the, the roof sloped in the right direction, this might be worth it. So I asked the solar install installer, what do you gain if you have a south facing um, structure? He's like about 20%. I was like, and what does that work out to in terms of yearly savings? And he's like five to $800. Okay, so five to $800, 10 years, we're five to 10,000. Huh, that may be actually worth it to have that scope and scale. And so I turned to them, I said, were you thinking of doing a garage? They said, eventually, like, well, this is a potentially something that suits everything. And because it's south facing and because they're in a dry high spot, they'd be harvesting all that rainwater anyway. So it doesn't matter, they'd have a gutter. So normally if you're doing a garage and you're doing what's called a shed roof, you would slope it away from the place that you're entering. But in this case, it makes sense. So it's that walking and looking and thinking and, and considering. And really when you're offering a solution saying, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, always starting with no. Right. It's like when you're raising kids, it's like when they ask you for something, you say no. Why? Because if you if if it is a no, eventually you've already said no. But if it's a yes, they're happy for it. So it's, it's you know, you try to keep in this mindset of I don't know if this is a good idea. Let's talk about this. And what's great about this approach is that it puts us in a humble position. So. I think that's all I have to say about that as Forrest Gump once says. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Great. Fantastic. All right, folks. So we're jumping into the next assignment. There's a, a video that showcases what to do and how to do it. So I, I won't do that again live with you because I've done that a number of times before. Uh, but generally, uh, if you're having problems with base map, if you need some one-on-one -on -one time, feel free to email me, javin at allpointsdesign.ca. Um, we can set up a Zoom. I've actually got one with one of your classmates in about an hour. Um, it's about 20 minutes. We just go over things. And if you need a bit of help, happy to, to reach out. You don't have to suffer alone. Um, if you feel like you're getting behind, I would suggest to start to schedule time for the course and the assignments directly into your schedule. If you keep a calendar, I like to keep about 20 to 25 minutes a day for something that I'm doing, plus uh, at least one or two, two hour blocks a week. So for a number of the courses I'm involved in right now, I'm leaving blocks of time to go back to the material and work through. Uh, I find that that keeps me on on task as opposed to, oh, I'll find time for it. I never do. So if you don't have scheduled time for this course yet, I would absolutely recommend doing it. And if you haven't reached out to somebody in the class and said, hey, I'd kind of like to be a study buddy. Uh, would you like to you know, connect maybe once a week for 30 minutes and just talk about what's going on? It can be a great way to keep the course alive for you. Not to mention it's accountability partner. So if you're, if you're connecting with somebody who's doing the course and they're like, great, what have you done? And you say nothing. Uh, humans are a herd animal. We tend to do better if we have somebody keeping us accountable. So, all right, folks, such a pleasure. Thank you again, Aaron, for the uh, question. It was nice to be able to share that. I, I don't think I would have normally. And um, if there are any other questions about drawing, hand drawing, digital drawing, or muddling through the non-layered world of Google Slides, please let me know. I'll see you guys in the next Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Take care.